I'm going to uh, tell you a work that uh, I've been doing with many collaborators and some notable collaborators that are in this room in the last 25 years uh, uh, spent at the ILL, Institut Laulan Jevan, nearby, so that's why you see the picture of the ILL on the screen. And as Beatrice said, uh, I moved one year ago to the European Spallation Source in, uh, in Lund. Uh, and if I have time, I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit about recent progress at this uh, um, new facility and what we hope to um, achieve uh, in terms of science with membranes. Now, for the students, sorry, those of you who might have had, uh, uh, had me in the last couple of years, so because I, I didn't get yeah, uh, some of the stuff you might already be aware. Uh, and for the student in the audience, a, a small uh, introduction about cellular membranes. So cellular membranes uh, surround uh, all cells and uh, also organelles within cells. Uh, they are rather complex uh, assemblies uh, composed of lipid proteins, uh, sterols, uh, uh, and a huge um, variety of molecules. And in terms of lipids, also there is a huge variety of different lipids composing membranes. Uh, they have a uh, short range uh, order, uh, a high degree of lateral uh, heterogeneity. So there is uh, a different composition on the, of the leaflets of the membrane, as well as uh, the uh, formation of domains uh, uh, into membranes. And they are transversely asymmetric. Uh, so physicists uh, uh, like to study membranes for um, many reasons that I show in the uh, next slides. Uh, but using uh, uh, real cell membranes uh, is difficult. So now, Narayan told me yesterday that uh, there's quite a bit of work that has been done here at DSRF on uh, uh, real membranes, but the analysis of uh, such complex systems is not trivial. And this is why we tend to model them with simpler systems, and basically we uh, model them um, um, we, we start using si the, simply the lipid bilayers. So, so lipids are these amphiphilic molecules. They have a hydrophilic part that faces uh, either the external of the cell, which is an aque aqueous environment, or the internal of the cell that is also uh, hydrophilic. And then uh, uh, as um, uh, the internal part uh, is mainly hydrocarbon chains, which are hydrophobic and assemble in these uh, uh, structures. Why uh, there is so much interest uh, for the study of cellular membranes uh, and lipid bilayers in particular? Well, first of all, uh, uh, they, are, uh, there is a, 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 they occupy a very large surface in, uh, in our body. Uh, the function of membrane proteins is dependent on uh, uh, membrane composition, also on uh, lipid protein interactions, lipid mediated protein protein interactions. Uh, there is uh, a large pharmacological interest uh, since uh, the uh, dra drug transport uh, inside cells uh, happens via interaction with the membrane. Um, they, uh, membranes play obviously a direct role in signal transduction. Uh, many, let's say, modern diseases like diabetes, Alzheimer's, Parkinson, etc., are associated in changes of lipid compositions. Uh, there are lots of nanobiotechnological applications, but above all, a very fascinating chemistry and uh, physics. So why do we use neutrons to uh, study uh, lipid bilayers, biological materials? Uh, neutrons have the very nice uh, um, property of uh, uh, allowing the access of both structure and composition uh, of material at the same time. Like X-rays, uh, they possess the right wavelength, so we can probe lengths that go from the angstrom or fraction of angstrom up to the microns. And these lipid bilayers, these structures uh, are about five nanometers thick, so uh, their size is perfectly uh, suitable for both neutrons and X-rays. And in addition, neutrons possess also ideal energies for uh, uh, spectroscopy of thermal fractations. Uh, we can probe uh, uh, dynamics uh, uh, that go from uh, the picosecond or from movements inside uh, uh, the molecules uh, up to uh, more macroscopic fluctuations. Um, what's 
uh, makes them uh, uh, also interesting for uh, soft and biological material is the fact that they interact with nuclei uh, and are very sensitive to uh, light atoms, so particularly hydrogen that is uh, uh, very abundant into, um, by, into membranes and biological materials. And uh, uh, more uh, interestingly, they interact differently um, with different isotopes uh, of the same element, and we exploit this property a lot by replacing uh, often hydrogens uh, in, into material with uh, deuterium, and in this way we are capable of highlighting uh, parts of the system that are of interest for us. So you can see, for example, uh, uh, if we talk about lipids, uh, by playing with isotopic substitution, uh, we are able to uh, look at the flip-flop of, um, um, of lipids from one leaflet to the other. If one uses a deuterated uh, material on one side and hydrogenous on the other side, uh, when the molecules flip-flop, it will give a different scattering signal, and we will be able to follow it. Or, for example, we are capable of determining low resolution membrane protein structures by putting into solutions these systems. We can form lipid nanodisks that make the membrane protein stable into a first solution. We can tailor the composition of the nanodisk so that it becomes transparent to neutrons. And when we do our measurement, we will highlight only our protein. Uh, this is much exploited in uh, biology also uh, for complexes uh, like uh, protein DNA complexes. By playing with contrast variation, uh, one can uh, uh, highlight either the protein or uh, uh, the DNA. So they see uh, materials differently than X-ray. So but I hope I'll show you in a minute that they are, the tools are really very complementary. Uh, being a neutron particle, they are highly penetrating, so we can access uh, um, varied interfaces. And the work that I've been doing in the last uh, 25 years has been mainly at solid liquid interfaces, where with neutrons we are capable of crossing the interface from the solid phase uh, and looking at what happens on surfaces. Uh, they, they are then uh, non-destructive, so we can uh, use this biological material, put it in the beam for uh, hours uh, or days. Uh, and this allows also us to use uh, um, extreme uh, sample environments, since we can uh, cross uh, um, easily uh, our sample environment. Uh, in terms of uh, imaging, uh, this was uh, where it stops now. Uh, it's very interesting, the capability to, in, in this particular example, we were seeing the movement of water into uh, plant roots. So it's very nice, the um, possibility to, to see light elements. And finally, um, uh, finally, uh, very importantly, although I don't use this uh, uh, so much, but Bill uh, will uh, uh, like that I mention it, uh, neutrons have a spin uh, and therefore uh, uh, sensitivities to magnetic properties. Uh, and they are very widely used for uh, uh, looking at mag magnetic systems, both uh, uh, structure and uh, um, excitations. So I'm going to um, tell you a work that I've been uh, uh, doing using the technique of reflectometry. Uh, it's a technique that is uh, a little bit in between uh, uh, low resolution, small angle scattering methods that one uses to uh, look at structures in, uh, in bulk and the high resolution uh, uh, diffraction. So it's, uh, we are uh, uh, capable of looking at uh, um, with resolutions that are of the order of a few percent uh, at structures that go from uh, some fraction of nanometer uh, uh, up to um, hundreds of nanometers. So, uh, with neutrons, we use mainly specular reflectivity, which means that we send our beam uh, at an interface at very grazing uh, angle, and we uh, look at the beam that is specularly reflected, reflected at the same angle as the incident beam. And this gives us information on of the structure perpendicular to uh, the interface, allows us to uh, determine thicknesses, uh, as well as roughness uh, or uh, interdiffusion and the composition normal to the interface. Um, 
And here is a simulation that shows to you um, how we, we use the, uh, this um, isotopic labeling or uh, uh, replacement of hydrogens with deuterium. Uh, what you see uh, here simulated is a, a liquid bilayer, um, a fully hydrogenous one in a D2O, uh, is a, a blue curve, and then a different mixture of uh, hydrogenous and deuterated uh, down here to the fully deuterated uh, material. As you see, uh, the position of this fringe uh, that gives uh, um, <laughs> uh, uh, that gives the um, that is dependent on the overall thickness of the layer doesn't move uh, when we uh, change its composition. Uh, but the shape of the curve is very different. And by analyzing this shape, uh, we can determine precisely how much material is on uh, the surface and what's its composition. For uh, in-plane features, so height fluctuations, or domains, uh, also uh, we need to use off-specular reflectivity. So uh, we, we look at the beam that is uh, uh, reflected in, in a direction other than the specular. And when we uh, work with uh, very thin films like these membrane systems, uh, neutron fluxes are not uh, high enough, so we need to go uh, to synchrotron radiation. And uh, uh, in this way, we, we are capable of, of getting uh, um, enough signal for uh, our study. And that's what I'm going to uh, tell you in a minute. But going back to our neutrons, so how do we... Uh, play, how do we cope with this uh, uh, lower resolution, so this lower flux, so these uh, uh, smaller Q ranges that we are capable to attain. Uh, we play again with our contrast uh, uh, variation method. We measure our uh, sample in a different um, aqueous contrast uh, in such a way that chemically the sample uh, remains the same, uh, so the structure doesn't change. Uh, but the uh, neutron signal uh, will change. And so by simultaneously uh, fitting data that have been uh, uh, collected in a different contrast, we constrain uh, uh, our model. So the analysis is done usually by model fitting, and we uh, can uh, become rather confident on the model that we have found. Uh, this is an example of a um, neutron uh, reflectometer. Uh, we have the possibility to uh, work in uh, time of flight. So we have the possibility uh, here we have uh, well, our neutrons coming uh, uh, from this guide uh, being passed by uh, choppers deflected on a, a surface and then a detector that will collect the reflected intensity, uh, which allows us to uh, measure the reflectivity profile, that is, uh, or the ratio of the reflected intensity over the incoming one um, in, a, in, a, in a wide Q range in a one go. So that gives us the possibility to do kinetic measurements. And so to exploit this uh, uh, contrast measurement method, we can, for example, uh, also not only uh, deuterate or uh, uh, use mixtures of uh, uh, deuterated water and hydrogenous water in contact with our system, but also deuterate the system itself. And here, for example, are uh, uh, examples of measurements of layers uh, with a sterile inside, where we use both hydrogenous and deuterated lipids, both hydrogenous and deuterated sterile, and different water compositions. And then when we do the analysis, so we uh, seek the model that satisfies this very large number of curves, and this gives us confidence on, uh, uh, on our system. Um, okay, uh, according to uh, the method that we want to use to look at these um, membrane systems, uh, we need to uh, optimize our samples. Neutron fluxes, again, are uh, low, so we uh, need to have large samples. Uh, for high resolution measurements, we would go to uh, diffraction studies, use uh, stacks of layers, uh, get uh, Armstrong resolution information. Uh, drawback is that these layers are not stable in uh, bulk water, so biologically are uh, a bit less interesting. Uh, for low resolution measurements, we go to SANS, and here we can use uh, micelles, uh, liposomes, uh, vesicles uh, in uh, bulk water, uh, get uh, an average information on um, 
hundreds or uh, uh, thousands of uh, molecules uh, in a, with a lower resolution. Uh, the interest of reflectivity is that one can look at a single uh, layer, single by layer, as in bulk water and uh, see the modifications induced by molecules in, inserted in the water uh, to the by layer. And, and that's one of the um, nicest ways to, to use them. The work I'm going to show to you, uh, where we've done uh, quite a lot of complementary measurements with, uh, between neutrons and X rays, is on uh, uh, floating by layers. So, on, uh, we are capable with Langmuir Blodgett, Langmuir Schaeffer techniques uh, to make two by layers uh, on the uh, solid substrate. Uh, basically, on uh, uh, this uh, well, bucket of water, it, like, this is a Langmuir trough. Uh, we are capable of spreading a monolayer of lipids, compress them to a, a given surface to make them stable. And if we have a very hydrophilic solid substrate, if we pull it up from the water, we will form a monolayer on the surface. If it goes down, we form a bilayer and then a bilayer. And finally, uh, with a, a slight modification, uh, uh, we get the fourth layer. So we uh, started working with this uh, uh, system many, many years ago in collaboration with uh, uh, Thierry Charita from Strasbourg and uh, Jean Dayan, uh, that at the time uh, was, uh, well, <laughs> was not, not, not yet in Soleil, so it's a long time ago. And uh, over the years, we, uh, well, initially, we've been uh, looking at the effect of temperature on these systems, uh, and we, we've been capable of detecting uh, uh, at the um, a transition of lipids from uh, a gel to a fluid phase, a swelling, a giant swelling of the, uh, this uh, floating layer uh, um, on, on uh, the bilayer. And we did the, with the, with the, the first uh, uh, of specular measurements here at the ESRF uh, that allowed us to uh, determine um, uh, lateral uh, fluctuations, uh, so bending modulus, uh, uh, tension of these uh, layers. Uh, we've then looked at several things on these layers. So that's the uh, publication so since 1999. Uh, very uh, recently, the effect uh, um, of charges. So that's a nice paper that came out in 2019, where uh, uh, we uh, determined the structure of a completely negative la uh, by layers uh, at the interface and see then uh, uh, compared to uh, neutral layers or uh, uh, deuterionic layers, uh, uh, there is a higher attraction of the uh, layers on uh, the surface. Uh, we've been uh, looking at the effect of current on the layers, uh, interaction with different uh, uh, molecules, like for example, nanoparticles or uh, gene delivery complexes. We've been looking at the uh, asymmetry and very recently to uh, transmembrane uh, um, insertion. And the work that I, I want to show to you, uh, this is a bit slow, sorry about that. Why it doesn't move? Okay, uh, the work that I'm, I'm going to show to you in more detail is the how we uh, is work done by student Tetiana Mukina that uh, was shared between the ILL and the Institute Charles Sadron with Thierry Charita uh, on the insertion and activation of functional bacterial rhodopsin into this uh, floating layer. Uh, bacterial rhodopsin is a, a small protein, a transmembrane protein. Uh, that acts as a, a light-driven uh, proton pump in uh, this uh, um, uh, bacterium, uh, Allobacterium salinarium, uh, and converts light energy into a proton gradient. It's very much loved by physicists because it's a very well characterized uh, protein. Uh, the structure uh, is well known. Uh, it is possible to uh, get it in uh, large amounts, and it's known how it uh, uh, modifies du during the uh, photocycle. So, uh, the work that we did was uh, inspired by uh, collaborations with uh, colleagues at the Institut Curie in uh, uh, Paris, so in the group of Patricia Bassero, 
uh, where they had been uh, looking with micro pipette uh, uh, experiments, a video microscopy experiments, at the um, um, that they had found with this experiment that uh, a larger uh, uh, excess area could be pulled out from the micro pipette when the uh, bacterial rhodopsin was active. So they were able to do to in insert the uh, bacterial rhodopsin into their vesicles and see that uh, there was uh, a larger uh, uh, area uh, pulled out when uh, uh, the the protein was uh, when they shine um, light and the protein uh, was active, and a strong the uh, decrease uh, diminution of the effective bending modulus of the membrane. Uh, they could also uh, from uh, the change of this area work out uh, a ratio between uh, an effective temperature of the thermal uh, of the active uh, fluctuations uh, uh, over. Uh, uh, the, um, the stable uh, over the thermal fluctuations of the non-activated system, and found that this ratio was uh, uh, ranging between two and three. Uh, all the information was at the micrometer scale, uh, so we uh, decided to uh, apply our method with off-specular scattering on floating bell layers and see if we could uh, uh, get uh, uh, information at a lower scale. So the first thing that needed to be done was to optimize the preparation of the system. So to find a way to insert into these floating layers uh, our membrane. And to do that, we needed uh, um, techniques in, uh, in the lab uh, that would uh, allow us to tell whether we, uh, how uh, to optimize, optimize this uh, system. So we did the fluorescence microscopy, atomic force microscopy, uh, so all the surface techniques. Uh, that told us what were uh, uh, the exact conditions that allowed uh, uh, insertion. And then uh, uh, we could use Newton reflectometry to quantify the uh, amount of protein inserted and uh, uh, X-ray synchrotron uh, reflectivity and of specular measurements to look at the structure, but uh, uh, more importantly, the fluctuation when uh, light was uh, shined on the system. Uh, for the preparation, we used a, de a detergent-mediated protein incorporation, which consists in uh, uh, dissolving the protein uh, in a solution in a detergent, and this uh, uh, helps out the introduction into the hydrophobic uh, membrane. Um, one needs to use the right detergent, one needs to use uh, uh, the right concentrations. Uh, it took uh, quite a long time to uh, our student to find the perfect conditions to do so. And when she did, we uh, did AFM measurements uh, uh, here at the IBS in uh, Grenoble, uh, as well as uh, uh, fluorescence microscopy uh, measurements. So we, we, we were confident uh, that the protein had inserted. And then we went to do neutron uh, measurements to quantify uh, the amount of inserted protein. Uh, in this case, what we did, we used a, a quartz substrate that is uh, uh, transparent uh, both to neutrons and light. So we could shine uh, light uh, uh, at our interface from the quartz side. And here is this setup on the D17 uh, reflectometer here at the ILL. Uh, and did measurements uh, again with our usual contrast uh, methods, so using our system in different uh, uh, water contrast, both on a, a single layer absorbed on the surface and on a, a floating layer, so we could uh, detect the amount of protein uh, inserted. Uh, when we switched lights on, uh, unfortunately, we didn't see. Uh, uh, many changes, so this was uh, a little bit annoying. Uh, I have an ex explanation later on. And that's uh, one of the reasons why we went to uh, synchrotron radiation. When we did these measurements, uh, YesRF was uh, doing the upgrade, so it was very, very, very difficult to get some beam time, but very likely we got beam time on the six beam line uh, at Soleil, and we did the experiment over there. Uh, in this case, the uh, sample looks differently because uh, instead of uh, getting to the interface uh, through the solid side, we get to the interface through the water side. Uh, so we shine, uh, uh, we here is a bucket of water with our sample on the bottom and we, we uh, come here with, uh, no, actually it's on the top. Uh, no, it's on the bottom, sorry. Uh, and we uh, get light from uh, uh, this whole here through uh, the water. 
that's how the setup uh, looks like uh, on the beam line. Uh, obviously, all these measurements are done in thermalized conditions. And that's what the uh, data uh, look like. So these are uh, specular reflectivity data from uh, the bilayer without bacterial rhodopsin, the um, dark dots. Uh, when we put bacterial rhodopsin, we have a very different signal. So that tells us that there is an effect on uh, something happens uh, at our interface. So hopefully the protein inserts into the layer. We think it does because uh, with all the preliminary measurements and neutron measurements, uh, this is what should happen. And then we shine light on and the signal uh, changes. We get this uh, green signal. We uh, shut off the light, uh, put the light off, and we go back to the original uh, signal, put light on, we go back uh, nearly where we were before. So we see an effect of shining light, and it is also uh, reversible. We're also capable of analyzing the data, and uh, uh, we can see what are the difference on the system with and without bacterial rhodopsin. Uh, the thickness of this floating layer in presence of protein increases, which is expected. Uh, the uh, thickness of the water layer between the two bilayers is um, nearly constant, uh, around 1.5 angstroms, uh, sorry, nanometers. Uh, and the roughness uh, increases a lot, so from 0.2 to 0.8 uh, uh, nanometers. Uh, if we switch on the light, uh, this thickness increases even further of one nanometer, so moves from six to seven nanometers. Uh, the uh, water layer also increases between the two bay layers, and the roughness uh, doubles. So, so already we can see uh, that there is uh, the effect of light uh, is very likely related to increased fluctuations as these uh, roughnesses and thicknesses uh, increase. So, um, so to study more detail the fluctuations, we, we have done uh, off specular uh, measurements. The analysis uh, is much more uh, complex and is uh, still in progress, uh, but we, we hope that uh, we conclude it in the, in, in the, next, uh, the next year, let's say so. Uh, so th this analysis, uh, again, uh, will, will allow us to uh, get the elastic parameters like bending modulus or surface tension and uh, interaction uh, potential according to this formula. Uh, although, yeah, well, the detailed analysis is in progress, there are still uh, things that can be uh, say, uh, said uh, just uh, well, with a rough analysis of the data. In particular, if we, um, the ratio of the intensity um, um, of the intensity with, with the uh, light on uh, and off it is proportional to uh, the ratio of the square of the roughness. Uh, and this uh, is uh, related to the, uh, this ratio of the effective temperature over the, I have five minutes, okay, so I will, uh, uh, over the, te over the uh, term temperature of thermal fluctuations. And we find from the specular and of specular data that this is around three to four, which is very close to what had been found by the original uh, um, experiments. Uh, so, yeah, well, we, as a summary, we uh, successfully incorporated this uh, protein uh, and we uh, could detect a, a magnification of membrane fluctuation. I have only five minutes, but and I want to show to you uh, what, uh, a little bit about the ESS. So I go very quickly on a similar uh, work done with uh, uh, increased complexity membranes. So in this case, membranes um, where we had uh, en enriched the floating layer with the gangliosides and cholesterol, which are so-called raft forming uh, uh, lipids. Uh, we've been uh, able with neutrons and playing with deuteration uh, to exactly determine the position of cholesterol uh, and how the cholesterol uh, uh, distribution uh, is influenced by these uh, uh, ganglioci ganglioside uh, molecules, which are molecules with a very large head. And here as well, we uh, did complementary uh, work here at the SRF uh, on uh, ID2 in, uh, on uh, vesicles. So, uh, the uh, well, colleagues, actually, this work uh, I'm not so involved. So colleagues with Narayan, uh, Laura Cantu uh, from Milan, and colleagues from Milan. 
uh, looked at the interaction of an enzyme that is capable of eating this head of the gangliocyte in vesicles. And what they observed is that with time, there was first an increase of the small angle intensity and then uh, a, a decrease. So different interpretations are uh, possible to explain uh, uh, this. So some uh, reversible uh, uh, either formation of holes or a breaking of the molecules they're recomposing. We wanted to look at that with uh, uh, reflectometry. So we mimic uh, the system in this way. We look at the interaction with the enzyme. In the case of neutrons, so we didn't see uh, much difference. This is our neutron window. And you'll see here uh, uh, with a synchrotron radiation on ID10, the effect is at much further away in Q. Uh, but even that uh, has not helped because uh, probably the system is, is a bit too difficult. I mean, so far we didn't manage to analyze this data. So, I mean, high resolution is important, but it's not, not the only thing. Many perspectives in, uh, in this area, uh, lots of things that are going on, but I want to use the, the last few minutes to uh, give you a bit of news about uh, uh, ESS, European Spallation Source. So all the work I show to you has been done at the ILL, highest uh, world highest flux uh, uh, reactor. that has been working for uh, reliably and very well for uh, more than 50 years. Uh, and unsurpassed, here is uh, a graph uh, very popular in the neutron community that shows the effective thermal neutron flux over the years in the different facilities. ILL reached the top uh, here in the, back in 1972, and that's not been uh, uh, surpassed. But uh, in the 80s, a different way of making or producing these neutrons for research started, which is uh, in a passive, um, spallation sources. And ESS uh, is uh, going to be the future spallation source possibly replacing uh, uh, the ILL as a world leading uh, facility. Uh, it's a, a source that uh, uh, back in 2009 was decided to site it in uh, Lund in uh, Sweden. Uh, construction started in 2014. We are here now. We expect to see the first neutrons by mid 2025 and to have a user program up and running by 2028. Briefly, how it works. Uh, we have a proton source. Uh, we accelerate uh, protons uh, in a uh, 600 meters uh, linear accelerator up to nearly the speed of light. Uh, there, we hit a tungsten target, which is uh, uh, composed of uh, well, more than four tons tungsten uh, bricks assembled inside this uh, um, uh, rotating uh, uh, ah, room, <laughs> uh, <laughs> wheel, <laughs> uh, into this wheel, cooled down uh, by helium, and uh, it rotates to uh, heat in uh, different places uh, our target uh, and uh, avoid uh, uh, having, uh, warming up too much the system. Uh, by spallation, we produce, as you saw with neutrons, we get uh, on each uh, fission uh, um, event about between two and three additional neutrons that we use for our studies. Here, uh, we get between 10 and 20 additional neutrons, so higher flux, but pulsed, uh, that is sent to uh, different uh, uh, instruments uh, for studying the structure and dynamics of matter. So by 2028, we should have 15 instruments, so five diffractometers, five spectrometers, uh, two reflectometers, and uh, uh, two small angle scattering, and, and one neutron uh, uh, protein crystallography um, protein crystallography um, instrument. Uh, the uh, length of the instruments uh, uh, is uh, uh, determined by the uh, science case. Uh, so we have for uh, um, very high resolution instruments, uh, they are down 160 meters from the target, and they are uh, basically the spectrometers uh, and a few others. While when we want to uh, profit uh, from a uh, high flux, uh, we uh, have much shorter uh, instruments. Uh, 
and because of the long pass, uh, we can uh, uh, use choppers and uh, um, shake uh, uh, the, the pass, and this is very much used over there. So where are we with the project timeline? Uh, we are uh, uh, here uh, in 2025, we expect BIM on target. By then, we should have five instruments uh, ready and commissioned. The others uh, will be installed uh, until end of 2027. Uh, we hope to welcome first users in, uh, already by the end of 2026, and then uh, have a transition to steady state in 2028. Lots of stuff happening uh, here on the accelerator and target side, here on uh, uh, the building of um, instruments, and just a couple of pictures. That's pictures of the accelerator, that is the first 40 meters, so the non uh, superconducting part uh, has been fully commissioned. Uh, the um, cryo modules uh, for the uh, superconducting parts uh, have all uh, been uh, uh, well, brought into the tunnel and uh, most of them installed. Uh, last week we had President Macron and the King uh, uh, coming to celebrate this because uh, the cryo, most of the, many of the cryo models have been produced in France uh, as uh, in-kind uh, contribution to ESS. Uh, the uh, monolith where the uh, target and the moderator go uh, has been uh, all the protection, the shielding has been completed and the target wheel has gone inside in November. Uh, and here is a progress on uh, instruments going on. And I just wanted to say that uh, for my work, uh, we are going to have two reflectometers, one STIA. Uh, focusing polarized reflectometer, allowing us to use very small samples and, and uh, small uh, quantities uh, uh, of material. And Freya, uh, very divergent uh, uh, extended Q range uh, instrument that should allow us to do very fast uh, uh, kinetics. Ex near the last slide, I expect these performances uh, compared to ILL. Uh, when we start at uh, two megawatts, we should be 10 times better. If we manage to go to the foreseen five megawatt, we are gonna be between 20 and 30 times better. Many challenges, lots of interesting work, and uh, I think I can finish here. I acknowledge uh, my collaborators, so most of the work was done with Thierry Charita and Jean Dayan, and you for your attention. <laughs>